Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Printed Circuit podcast, where we discuss trends, challenges, and opportunities across the printed circuit engineering industry. I'm your host, Steph Chavez. In this episode, we'll focus on concurrent design. And here to join me to discuss uh, this topic is Chris Young, who's a very near and dear friend of mine, as well as a longtime uh, colleague of mine that, that he and I have been collaborating with for at least 20 years. Um, he's the owner and lead engineer of Young Engineering Services. Chris, thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks, Steph, for having me. I'm excited that you're here and that we're going to talk about concurrency and your perspective, and especially you being a, a business owner and a, a very senior level double E architect of system design and rack systems, because I know what you're capable of and, and what you've produced in the past for major corporations. Chris, can you give the audience a, a brief introduction of your background of what you bring to the table, not just for this discussion, but for the industry? I started out my career working in the semiconductor industry as an intern. I grew into a semiconductor test engineer. From there, I actually went into avionics and I've done medical and some other commercial electronics, done some space as well, worked on the Orion program that is now part of the Artemis project at NASA. As a brief interview of my own personal skills, currently I'm primarily a technology provider or solutions provider for companies. If they need to design a product or design a test system to get something done, I'll come in wholesale and do the whole project with very little technical requirements. I will generally generate requirements and then push that on through into the design phase and production and support. I've seen some of these systems that you've designed and it's amazing where you're pretty much given very few definition requirements and it's amazing what you produce. And I've seen these full-fledged rack systems, how you've done things. And every time I collaborate with you, I'm blown away at, you know, at the skill set and what you're able to achieve, especially when you have customers who don't know what they want, but they want it cheap and they want it fast. <laughs> when I say cheap, I mean, they just want uh, the least amount of budget and the shortest amount of design time. And it's amazing what you're able to deliver. And being that you're a one-man shop and you bring it from uh, firmware uh, or writing code to d developing hardware to creating schematics and then designing circuit boards. And it, you're one of the few double E's that can really run with the best of them, in my opinion. So like I said, it's, it's great to have you here. So Chris, tell me, what are your overall impressions when we think of concurrent design? And when I thought about this topic, you're the first person that, that comes to mind because you have a, a very unique perspective because you straddle the whole spectrum from a system architect of how I refer to you. So can you give me your overall impression of concurrent design? My overall impression is that it's a very powerful design concept and design tool to have and severely underused. If I was to think philosophically about it, concurrent design is the closest thing we have to working together in a group real time. It's just a natural evolution from this more serialized process, which we've been using over the years. Yeah, we've gained efficiency by batching up certain serial tasks so that multiple people can work parts of a schematic or parts of a layout. But then you have to go through this serialized integration process, like now the schematic's done. Then there's the layout, and then there's the routing. It's time consuming. And what it really leads into is that there's tight fit issues. What I've primarily seen is it's a tight fit at the end because you've stacked up all the risks to the end of the project, you know, at the end of the design. And that's tough to get a hold of when you're working in that type of mentality now that concurrent design real true concurrent design where you've got one base project and you've got multiple people working on it i mean it just lends itself to more of what i'll call natural play when you sit down with someone in a boardroom or you sit someone in a conference room and you start talking back and forth it's interactive with each other and then you bring that to the whiteboard you ever seen people work on a whiteboard penciling out a problem together, and then people will erase and rewrite and different, you know, someone will even come over to your stuff. Maybe, hey, maybe we shouldn't do this here. Maybe we should do that. And they'll scribble something down over what you have. And then you look at it and go, you know, that's great and awesome. This is what concurrent design allows you to do in the design phase, not just in the layout, but the schematics, the constraints, 
placement, you can have a group of people working together as if they're right there at the whiteboard in a conference room or sitting down together, penciling out stuff on a piece of paper or on a napkin. Gives you that type of flexibility. I couldn't agree with you more. And I've been in those meetings where, where you have many of us jumping on a whiteboard and going back and forth, back and forth and scribbling on each other's or over each other. And then when you take that concept and you, you take it into the real world of the process of designing a circuit board, that's the true evolution of concurrency, as you described. And I couldn't agree with you more on that. Can you give me an example, a very general example, when you think about that? I know you talked about a whiteboard, but you and I have talked before about this, and I really liked your example you gave me uh, the other day about uh, Legos and, and building blocks. Can you give me an example of that? I like to make things understandable across the wide range of people. That's how I've been the most successful as a business owner. An example that's very relatable to people is playing Legos with my daughter. How has it changed over time? Well, when we first introduced her to playing with Legos, we showed her some Legos and we showed her how they connect to each other and we let her be with that. And then we guided her into the serial assembly process that you get. That's the instruction book that comes with a Lego set. Follow the instructions step by step in order. It takes a while to get it done, but they, they, you know, they grow up and they become proficient at it. As she got further along, we started doing more of a batch process where we'll gather parts for each stage and then start to build it. And then it became to a point where we did more of a batched and segmented where while she was constructing, I was gathering components for her for the steps. So she didn't have to even worry about gathering components for her build. She could just concentrate on building. And then where it is today is that we've become proficient at being able to work together and learn how to work together such that if we were to build a castle, like a Lego castle, I would take on the towers. She'd take on the walls. I'd be building the towers to support the walls while she's building the walls. If I fall behind, she'll just naturally come right in and help me build the towers so that the building of the wall doesn't get delayed. And it doesn't happen. It's not a communication There's no verbal permissions. There's no set of formal communication that has to take place and take time. It just very naturally happens. And this is how kids learn how to actually work in groups. This is very natural group work behavior. And that's my example of that. And that's how I convince people that, hey, this is worth your time because it's very natural. It's very easy to understand across business units. I really like the simplicity of your analogy that you make with the Lego blocks. I've been in many meetings with you and other uh, design engineers, especially when you talk about project managers or you get some VPs or some directors in meetings where they don't understand the technical side as being in the weeds, where is when you start mentioning something more simplistic in the approach, then you see the light go off or the aha moment or the light turn on and the aha moment happens and, and then they get it and then they buy into what you're saying or what is being discussed, it's more relatable. That's why I really wanted to make sure you you brought up that analogy with the Lego blocks. With that said, Chris, I want to ask you, you pointed out in areas in the beginning uh, when you started talking about concurrency of what people think they are doing or why their process is the way they are. You know, what do you think doesn't work today when it comes to concurrent design? Well, in general, I think there's a misunderstanding of what concurrent design is. When I talk to people about concurrent design or doing things together, instead of what we're doing today, or most places are doing today, they think they're already doing concurrent design. They think this batched parallel process is actually concurrent design. You know, people go away, do their thing, come together, then integrate. They don't understand that integration could really happen while you're doing it. So again, there's a misconception Another problem is what is happening with this batch parallel process works for most people. One thing I've learned growing up, it's hard to argue argue with working. Almost impossible sometimes. Hey, I know this works, but you could be doing it better. What people will hear in general is, hey, you're not doing it right. They'll be like, how am I not doing this right? It's working, I'm making money, and I'm making a lot of money doing this. So I just don't believe it. Now, there are other areas where people have difficulties. Some people like to do things by themselves. They're very independent people. That can come from two things, you know, either naturally or environmentally. 
mostly is what I've seen. I mean, of course, there's exceptions to the rule. So naturally is just someone who naturally likes to work by themselves. And they may be a powerhouse. And that gives them more reason or more of an argument to work by themselves because look what I can do. What I can do in 40 hours, your team of people can't do in three weeks. You know, And that's true. I've seen it. The other part of it is environment. And I'm talking about the, the person who does want to work in teams. However, they've been burnt so many times in this batched parallel process where people don't get their stuff done. Like, you know, you're, you're supposed to be working on, let's say, the processor IO schematics and someone's supposed to be working on the power supply schematics. Well, the power supply schematics never really get done. And you've got to pick that up yourself and do it and get it done. So the project gets done so you can deliver. Well, that happens enough times. People don't want to work in teams. They don't, they don't see any value in it. And in fact, they just, they, they see it as the, the reason why they have to work late and be away from home. Those are some of the major steps I see from more of a like technical hands-on standpoint. You know, you look at it from like a program management standpoint. I've had to fill the role of a project lead program manager before. What I'm looking for is I have to sell this to a group of people. I have to sell this project to a group of people who are going to ask a question. And that question is, are you going to be able to get it done? Yes or no? They don't want to hear explanations. They don't want to hear, well, you know, there's this caveat here. Caveats mean risk and it's probably not going to work. So they're going to go basically with what they know. They know that these processes in their organization work. It's going to be very hard to persuade a program manager that has a recipe that works for them and gets the approval of the people where he's been able to deliver yeses. So you got a program manager who's able to deliver yeses to his team of management. And that's typically, you're talking directors, vice presidents, maybe even the CEO, depending on the size of the company. Why would you change if you're able to deliver yeses? You know, in the Miller world, a customer is not going to pay for you to update your processes on his project. They want their project with the lowest budget and in the shortest duration. They don't want to pay for you to update your processes so that way you can be better and more optimized for everyone. They, they're selfish and, and I don't blame them. You know, it's like taking your car to the mechanic. I'm not paying you to, to get trained on a new process. I want you to fix my car at the least amount of expense. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more on that. And I've seen it more in the mill arrow side of the industry than anywhere else of, hey, our formula has been successful and it makes us money and we're getting contracts after contracts. So there's no reason to change, even though they're leaving money on the table and that money could be, you know, 25, 30% of money on the table. The success they're having is good enough. The bottom line is the shareholders are happy. They're in the black and there's no reason to change. So yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more on that. So what do you think, Chris? Uh, you know, when we look at, uh, uh, you know, concurrency, what do you think the problems can be? Uh, and what are the solutions for the best practices when designers view this approach and what should be implemented? Well, from a design standpoint, designers should really understand what the end goal is. A lot of designers get caught up in the fact that they're designing a board and they think it's their board. And they're more interested in what they're doing with their board than what the actual project is about. And stay focused on delivery. And I'm not saying take the fun out of it. I'm saying do what's best to get the job done and focus on that. And I know this, is, this isn't some type of uh, tangible object we're talking about. This is an intangible concept here. But it's stay focused. Get, we got to get this job done and we have to do what's best. And you be willing to grow. Many of my mentors in my life, the advice they give me is if you're not growing, you're dying. <laughs> and it's very true. You know, eventually what will happen is your approach will no longer work. If you just don't change what you're doing, at some point it's not going to work. And I know that seems rather pessimistic. However, would we be able to feed 7 billion people today if everything was done with a uh, horse and buggy? We're not going to be able to get supplies where we need them across the world with a horse and buggy. It's not going to work. That's why we evolved our transportation systems in the world. It's a very common experience in life. 
in throughout history. Now, that being said, when you come down specifically to do the board design, if you have a team of designers, they need to, you know, they need to agree upon certain things. They need to understand what materials are being used on the board. What's the stack up? What are my net classes? Which nets are in there? What's my stack up going to look like? And stick to it as a team. And then everybody has to agree on it. Nothing frustrates me more than going into a project, you get a team working on something, and midway through, one of the designers unilaterally changes the stack up. That never happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It has been most of my experience working in teams. Someone has come along and changed the board stack up, and it's aggravating. And they had a legitimate reason, but they didn't communicate it to anybody. So there's certain rules you have to set in place about what you're going about. Expedition is a very good constraints-based tool. You can put in constraints that govern your trace widths, your spacing, the vias, how, how far the vias are spaced apart, what type of clearance you have from the edge of the board. But as a project, there were higher level architecture needs to be adhered to. And if it's going to change, it needs to be a team decision, not just an individual contributor. I know I'm picking up on the board stack up, but this also falls through with, if you're going to change constraints in an area, if it's your area, make a new constraint for your area. You know, make that constraint local to your area and don't make it global. And I know these sound like very watered down kind of dumb examples or simplistic examples. But these are the things, these simple things are what bite you in the designs. You know, I spoke very briefly about what I've done. I've done, you know, I've been through this board design process several hundred times in my career <laughs> with varying companies. And these simplistic things are what bite you. Now, that being said, this is where I think concurrency helps, you know, because you see real time. You got people working together on the project. Someone changes the stack up. You go, whoa, 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 wait a minute here. What's going on? It's not a surprise. It's not something out of left field. Or someone's playing with the constraints, like maybe trace widths in a certain area, and that affects you. And you can at least flag that as it's happening real time, you know, just like you're at the whiteboard. I mean, I'm going to keep bringing this whiteboard back up. It's like work. I love concurrent design from the standpoint, it feels like working on the whiteboard with someone going over trying to design something. I couldn't agree more. When you're talking about you're having multiple double E's in a schematic or multiple designers, which is the front end, you have multiple designers in the back end and layout, or a combination of some in the front, some double E's in the front, some designers in the back end, all simultaneously at the same time, cohesively working and truly taking advantage of horsepower within the tool of expedition, being able to achieve a lot more man hour effort in a shorter duration of cycle time and being able to do that in a very cohesive manner to where you're not stepping over each other. Instead, you're collaborating together as if you were at the whiteboard, everyone all at once, you know, working and collaborating at the same time, rather than waiting to the end and you're having your risk. As you mentioned, you have your risk is at your highest at the end. It's even more devastating to make a change at the end than it is to do it on the fly with this concurrency that is happening as you're unfolding and you're traversing down the, the design cycle of the design. I couldn't agree with you more on that, in that evolution. So walk me through some of the examples of how it would work from your perspective as you envision concurrency. So the first example that comes to mind is me sitting down in the role of a double E. I'm working on the schematic. I'm connecting the symbols putting the net lines in, making sure the connectivity follows the intention of the circuit that I have designed. Well, what's the physical realization of that schematic? That, that's hard to tell. The best example could be where you have a designer working on that circuit and doing some rough placement and some rough sketching of traces so that the double E can see what's being implemented. The double E could have picked a component that looks great on paper. But when you get to the layout, you're like, wow, that node 
can't be dropping through the board to get to this other part, particularly if you get like a high high speed amplifier and there's a feedback, you know, you have your feedback. Do you really want that feedback traversing through layers to get where you need to go? Or do you want to maybe pick another component that will allow you to isolate where the feedback node is on your circuit in the physical layout so that you don't get down the road when the board's built, and then you realize that you have a VF picking up noise, power supply noise. What you anticipated for a power supply rejection ratio on your component doesn't mean anything because you have a VF picking up noise in the feedback loop. I've seen that a lot. <laughs> you know, people are like, I don't understand what's going on. I mean, I can only, it seems like once we turn everything on, this circuit doesn't work. It's just like it's so. Uh, you know, it's railed to one end. What, what's going on here? You know, and it's like, well, you've got a via that's making your life very miserable. You know, it's connected to something very sensitive. I've also seen that. I've seen it in RF design. Working on the frequency up converter for a high power transmitter. We're trying to reduce the local oscillator leakage through a mixer. And what happened was, is that someone dropped a via for the local oscillator signal near the component, the mixer component itself. And from the top pad of the via to the output, the RF output from the mixer, it completely destroyed the isolation of the mixer that was inherent in the mixer. The major leak path was now that via in the output. And that wasn't caught. That was actually in testing, like, whoa, what's going on with our LO isolation at the output here? This is horrible. I am very sure that if the double E was seeing some of this real time, or if there were other CAT engineers working with them, they would have caught this instantly. I would have seen it and I would have been like, get that out of there. And especially now, since I've seen that type of problem go down. So I think double E's working with a designer while doing the schematic is extremely helpful and getting the primitive placements and routing styles and making sure that sensitive nodes are taken care of. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that that collaboration has to happen. And it's not fair to a double E to give him a design that has over 10,000 vias and say, okay, now I need you to review design and then you got two hours to review it or you got you know, one day to review all this, a board that has over 10,000 or 20,000 connections and he's, he's looking at it. And yet, you know, you have uh, different disciplines doing their simulations and so forth, but the lead double E that's in charge of the project, it's a challenge. And so this is where I feel when it comes to designing circuit boards, um, we're way past the days of, of just connecting the dots. You know, it's not connecting the dots in, in because our speeds were so low back in the day that we can get away with making mistakes and it didn't bite us. But today's uh, complexities and challenges that we face, you need to analyze and check things and you need to work in concurrency because if not, you will produce a brick. And that's a quick way to get fired is, is to waste money, waste money and waste time over and over on a project. So tell me, what do you see are roadblocks when we think about concurrency? What do you think that are road or the blow blocks implementing for this best practice? I actually think the biggest roadblock is getting buy-in from higher level management. Yes, thank you. I, I, that, I couldn't agree with you more on that. So the adoption rate for concurrency seems kind of slow. Off the top of my head, I don't really under, I don't know any place that is actually killing it, you know, with the, <laughs> with their designs and then they go, we did this because of concurrency. Even if they did claim to be concurrent, most of these places would go, well, we're concurrent too. I mean, we have guys working on this, you know, we have multiple guys working on schematic. We've got multiple designers working on the boards. I mean, so there's a two-part thing, which is there needs to be some education. And then there needs to be some type of benchmarking so that these companies can see it happen. Basically going to them and telling them they should be using a functionality within a tool it's going to sound like you're complaining, is basically it. It's not going to get you what you want. You're just going to sound like you're complaining. What I would see is that, you know, you have someone like yourself or Greg Beers coming to you 
say, you should really be using this functionality in the tool set. And then, you know, my initial thought is, why are you complaining to me about your tool? That's the business side of what I have to deal with. I have companies come to me all the time, sales engineers, application engineers, and they go, wow, you know, you should be really using this new and great thing and be doing this because it's a better way to do it. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm, I'm using your stuff. I mean, what's the incentive? And then you hear things like, well, you could be doing it 35% faster with no examples, no understanding of it really happening. Well, you know, okay, you say that, but I mean, is this just sales? Like, come on. Everybody's got something that makes something 35% faster. I know that could sound harsh, but that, I mean, that's, that's the reality of what you're trying to break through. And then you're asking a program on top of that, when you get to these projects at these large companies, you're asking the program manager to bet his job on it's going to work. Because if you have a project go really bad or a program go really bad, it's the project manager, it's the program manager, it's the project engineers. Those end up being sacrificed. <laughs> you know, they're brought up before the, I mean, I've been in this situation where I've been earlier in my career as project lead. You know, you get brought up before the executive board and grilled hard. And the questions you get asked, why should we keep you here? Why should you be here? So you don't want to find yourself in that situation. What you want to do is get them in a situation where, where they're just like, wow, I mean, you just saved us a ton of money on our program and you deliver early. It works. It's early. Thank you. Those type of experiences and that type of work, you know, working example, that's how you win them over. But you got to have to be able to provide evidence of that. Those are good examples. You know, I was going to ask you about how do you see someone to overcome, you know, roadblocks that are within the company? And I think you gave us an example. Do you have any other examples that you can share with us how you think someone can overcome these roadblocks in their organization? Well, if you want people using concurrency in, their, in the designs, we'll just start with you want to be able to provide someone a, a natural use case when you're onboarding a new customer for your product, right? I've seen the demos. They come in and do the demos, and then you try to get it working on your system. What you should really be going in with is send in your application engineers with multiple laptops ready to go for what you intend to do. And then you sit down with the engineers and you work with them on a design concurrently. You show them, you work with them together. So it's a training session. So here's here I brought some laptops already set up to do what we need to do. Because if you show up the company with your laptop and you say, oh well we can do it, but there's the IT block at most of these companies, right? It's not going to work out well. So bring your computers, bring some type of router or some type of mini server system so that you can sit down with them. Here's my laptop. Here's the laptop I brought for you so we can work on this and see this together. And that's just, you know, you can show them how to do this, exactly how it should go. You want to come in with the closest you can to a real world project. Because I think the ultimate way to show customer is to tell the customer, give me one of your projects and I'm going to show you how you can do this faster and better. Because I can tell you from experience that, that I'm undergoing right now with some colleagues of mine, they have an issue, but the way for us to really dig into it is to give me your database and let me show you how you can do this better and faster. But then they're like, no, we can't uh, for IT purposes or, or for whatever purposes, um, we can't give you the database, but can you just show us? But then they take the demo we're showing. Well, that's just a demo board. That's not the same. You know, that's not real world. Well, you really want to be real world. Then Give us something that we can show you in real world what we, we can do or how we can implement it to be better, be faster. And I think that is what you're describing. Am I right? Pretty close to it. I, I know that you're still using the word show you. What I would say is let's sit down and work on this together. Yes. There's a way that we can do this concurrently. Mm -hmm. We'll do it together. And that's how we make this work is together. We can go on and on, Chris. So with that, I want to thank you as we've outlined the best practices when it comes to concurrent design. I think you're spot on in what you said. Thanks again, Chris, for joining us and for your invaluable insight on this and from your industry's perspective as a 
system architect, a double E, and, and then a business owner who understands when it comes to the true cost of engineering. So thanks again for being here and joining us. Yeah, thanks, Steph. It's my privilege. You know, I, I enjoyed talking with you. I enjoyed talking to you about these things. Tune in to our next episode where we talk about design reuse. 